Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Over the last 30 days, we can see there have been several places across the United States that have had um, an excessive amount of precipitation. This graphic shows the last 30 days on percent of normal, and you can see here that these deepest blues get up there into that 200 to 325 percent range. And there's a lot of places that have gone well over that. And just thinking about this, it's interesting to note the places that have missed out on some of that heavy rain, like the high plains of Texas and Colorado back into New Mexico, parts of the lower uh, Mississippi River Valley over here in the Carolinas and also here in parts of the upper Midwest and also very uh, well-defined rain shadow effect in this part of Montana. But outside of that, some places have been very wet. It's starting to work away on our longer term drought monitor. So this is the latest update we got this morning from the drought monitor. And what I want to do is I want to go to it and show you the change we've seen over the last month. So let's go do that. When you look at that change map, we can start to see those places that had had a drying signal over the last 30 days including this part of the Red River Valley over here into this part of the Cotton Belt and then getting up to the High Plains here. Those same regions we just pointed out here showing up drier while we've seen improvement in other places. Now from there, what I want to do next is I want to show you a map. I don't often show this one to you, but it's cumulative downward solar flux. And what that means is we're looking at, compared to normal, how much of the sun's energy gets through the clouds down toward the surface. So this is a surface-based cloud, uh, or excuse me, surface-based um, solar flux anomaly. And wherever you see these cooler colors, that would represent where we've uh, missed out on a lot of sunshine. So if you felt in parts of the Corn Belt, upper Midwest, into the you know, New England area, or certainly here in the whole of the West, that you've gone a long time without seeing the sunshine, I just thought I'd want to point that out to you, that um, the, the data here are showing pretty sizable deficits overall in the last 30 days. Whereas where those places have been drier, we've seen an abundant amount of sunshine. Now, speaking of sunshine, I did want to point out today as we saw the, the sun setting here, let's go back in time, that for many across the midsection of the country where high pressure has built in, we have had uh, some clearing skies, which has been quite nice. A couple of things to take note of here. Um, when you look and see the high, thin clouds that are running here out of the Gulf of Mexico toward Florida, that's actually going to be part of a system we're going to watch develop here that's going to go over Florida late this week. Uh, but uh, other than that, this has been an interesting last several days as we started to see the temperatures finally cool off in the eastern half of the country. In fact, we've even seen some lake effect snow going so far this year. So over the last three days, we're looking at lake effect snow here. And also we're catching the very tail end of that system uh, in this 72-hour snowfall map that came out here in parts of the uh, central plains. Now, thinking about where we're heading with these temperatures first, we do have freeze warnings and frost advisories out that stretch all the way from the Mid-South into parts of the Mid-Atlantic here, including the Piedmont of, of North Carolina there. So we're going to watch out for those cold overnight temperatures. But this is going to be the extent of it here on Friday morning, where I start to see some rebound in those temperatures. And while that's happening, we've got uh, very strong winds tonight here on Thursday night and uh, working into the west. In fact, I was looking at that wind field this afternoon and this evening. A couple things to take note of. Got a high pressure cell that's sitting over Illinois. It's going to take a long time to just move over here toward the southeast. Out ahead of it, we're going to watch a low that's going to come out of this part of the Gulf, go across Florida, and really begin to develop right in this area. Now, earlier this week, we thought that that system was going to hug the coast. The upper level flow was suggesting that it was going to do more of a kind of a nor'easter track, but instead now it is going to be moving out to open ocean, so that's good. But with higher pressure still sliding to the southeast, we've got the cooler air in place, uh, but the greatest extent of it, I think, will be on Friday morning, and we're going to have several clear days in a row after that. But now you can start to see on the back side of this as the flow comes out of the south and west where we're starting to push that, you know, those above average temperatures back up into this area. And we're also getting those very strong winds out in the western part of the United States as well. Now, speaking of winds, I'm going to take you up in the atmosphere, jet stream level winds here, and we're going to look over in the Gulf of Alaska. Because we have seen the flow doing this a lot throughout the month of October now into early November. And these little short waves, there's one here, there's another one that you see right there. There are several that are kind of just in the flow. Each one of these is going to be a part of a system that eventually takes shape as it comes around this broader trough in through here and ends up some, at some point next week in the, in the plane. So we're going to watch that carefully. Now to show you that, I'm going to take you to the 12Z European run here. And we're going to kind of piece these things together. Are you ready? So as we play forward through Friday and into Saturday, the first thing you note is there's the coastal system that's going to move out. There's a ridge moving into the midsection of the country. That's the warm-up. And then you can see right here this deeper trough that is sitting in place that's just continuing to target the Pacific Northwest with more moisture. Now, while that's setting up shop like that, what we're going to see is several little it's, it's even hard to pin this down, but several pieces kind of coming around the backside of this trough 
that are eventually going to work their way into the West Coast, but not until we get through the weekend. You see over the weekend, there's a little short wave that comes through here on Tuesday, and we're going to show you the rain we're expecting possibly in this area, but it's this bigger wave that I'm more concerned about because from Tuesday the 9th into Wednesday the 10th and Thursday the 11th, the operational European run drops a pretty substantially deep trough in this area. But the operational European does have a different look on this than, for example, the, um, the GFS and even the ensembles, which means we don't yet have the timing of this thing down just perfect just yet. But one thing's for sure, the models are attempting to, once we get into next weekend, build a pretty sizable ridge back into the west. That's going to leave this cooler air over the southeast while that ridge is reestablishing itself in the west. I'm going to show you all of these things when we look at our multi-model analysis here. Now, over the last, I don't know, three or four videos, I've been pretty keen on telling you, wow, the models, the European on the right and the GFS over here on the left, have done a pretty good job kind of staying in lockstep. They're not going to do that this time. So let's start out here and just see how the next couple of days unfold. We're going to continue to see the stronger onshore flow in the Pacific Northwest and the system I mentioned here coming out of the Gulf moving across Florida. Wet conditions right in through this area. It's in both models, as you can see. And that system is going to just sit right off the coast, possibly bringing some wetter weather into the Carolina coast, but then move out. See that moving out pretty quickly. In the meantime, when we look out here Monday morning, getting through the day on Monday, and then starting to play out here into Tuesday, the models are have a little bit different look by that point on two different systems. The first is through the Hudson Bay, and the second one here in the European at 6 a.m. on Tuesday, kind of popping out and bringing some precipitation uh, on the northern side here. Don't quite yet see it in the GFS. As we play forward, though, we got this broader front that's sitting here, but the GFS develops a low on the back side, and that low is not there in the European, okay? So what ends up happening here is that low then moves over the Red River Valley of the North and then sets up over, um, you know, between Lake Superior and this part of Ontario and Quebec. So the GFS has this lead system that kind of advances, and it's nowhere to be found in the European. The European has a much later arriving wave, and it develops a much deeper low, possibly around Iowa and Missouri. Now, on the European, this means that possibly next Wednesday night, but then getting into Thursday, Friday, we're going to drag a front from the southern plains over to the southeast, and it's going to be a severe weather maker. You can see her going through the day on Thursday, now getting out there into Friday. While both models now, the GFS with a second system, the European with its first, to be honest, they have a different overall strength and timing of these two systems, but the net effect is we're going to bring something through the Midwest, through the Corn Belt, through the Plains as we look at the end of next week. And then there's more stacked up here coming into the Pacific Northwest. Now you see, I mean, very different systems in the models for late next week. And the reason why, I just want to come back to this. We're waiting on several smaller features in the flow of the jet stream to kind of coalesce and come through the flow in order for this to happen. We won't know what these really look like until they get over our weather observation system here in the western part of North America. I'm talking about the surface weather stations, the weather balloons, uh, better radar coverage. That's what we're waiting on to get a better picture of all of this. But I'm going to compare them. Let's go ahead and compare the models, and this is what you get. You see, the GFS has the first system that comes through here and then pulls through the Great Lakes. So it's wetter there. Remember, these colors represent wetter GFS. The European has the much bigger, slower system emerging here, and that's why it's got much more rainfall in the model there than the GFS does. Okay, The GFS is more aggressive on the next couple systems coming into the Cascade Mountains. And you can see those differences there as they come over the Northern Rockies as well. So there's some important model differences here. While you know I traditionally side with the European, I'm going to tell you either solution is a possibility at this time. The European has been consistent, though, with a big system at some point coming through here. And this is what the latest European ensemble suggests. Now, when you look at this, there's a bunch of L's on the graph. What that means is each L is the position out there next, uh, this is around midnight on Wednesday night going into Thursday morning, where the lows may possibly emerge. And the European's got a southern track down here, and it's also got a second possibility there. So even among its own ensemble, the European still has a lot of spread. What's important to see is that it's trying to produce something here at the end of next week. And that's what I want to key in on. Now from there, I do have to show you this, and this is purely for entertainment purposes only. These are the 12Z runs and the snowfall. Now you know that the European produces that much bigger system. So starting next Thursday, getting into Friday, it's just putting down the snow here. Now remember, 
This is a single operational run. We are purely looking at this for entertainment purposes only. Are we comfortable with that? Because it's going to change a whole lot between now and when the, 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 the system actually gets here. But this is just the latest what it's got. And might as well look at the GFS. Ready? So here it comes. Much different look, right? It takes a second system through the border of Iowa and Minnesota and then curls it up, as you saw in the Eastern Corn Belt. So that's where it puts down the snow. Neither one's going to be right. Neither of them is going to be right. And the ensembles, take a look at this. That's the European 12Z ensemble showing you the probability of getting an inch of snow. What you don't see is any well-defined tracks other than in the mountains, which means that when you average all of the 51 different runs of the model together, they wash out the main feature, which means we do not have good predictive skill on this system just yet. We're going to have to be patient and wait for it to come through. Now, thinking about that, I want to take you to what the height patterns look like, the trough ridge patterns look like from the October 20th through the beginning of November. And it's been this trough that's been most key to be paying attention to because it has hugged the West Coast. So systems have continually blasted the West Coast from Northern California to Oregon and Washington, and they've come into the mountains. And we've also started to see lately more of a, of a secondary trough that's here. So the flows kind of come around and dove like this. We've had this big blocking ridge in place. Now, why I'm discussing this is I, I want you to see where this is because watch what the models are doing. This is day seven, so we're out there November the 11th. And as we play forward, that's the trough that advances into the midsection of the country, potentially producing this big, well, winter storm next week. But then we see that by the time we get to next weekend, the 13th and the 14th, it settles that trough down here from the Ohio River Valley all the way down to the southeast. And it allows a ridge to build. Now on Monday, we didn't see this ridge. It wasn't in the models, it was flat. And this trough wasn't here, it was much closer to the west coast. And if you remember last week, I kind of got punked by the models when they suggested the same thing was gonna happen. And what ended up happening was that this trough was closer to the United States. So if you don't mind, we need to do this. I need to watch all next week to see how this pattern evolves before I can really make a solid call on mid-November. But as it stands, if this is the case, the West Coast warms up, convergence in the midsection of the country, so drier here, but we'll start off with precipitation increasing all in this area. In fact, let's just look at it. You see, this is the area that we expect to have the above normal rainfall because the system comes through late next week and the trough then dives in after it. We're then drier on the backside. That's expected, right? So that gets us out all the way to November 18th on precip. Let's now take a, a shot over here at temperatures. We've already seen that we got those frost advisories out. Let's just get to Friday morning here. That might be the deepest to, into the south that the cold air gets uh, in the near term. So this white line is kind of dashed into there. That represents where we have the freezing air. But as we go from Friday to Saturday, Sunday, Monday, see the warm up happening? That's the ridge that comes in. In fact, let's go look at those high temperatures, see how they look. Because here's yesterday's highs, Thursday, or tonight. I'm recording this on Thursday night, but here's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I mean, by Sunday, 80s in the panhandle, steep in the 60s in the western corn belt. That's nice. And it just spreads there on Monday into Tuesday. Now, that is the warm-up inside of that first ridge that kind of preps the atmosphere, juices it up, and gets it ready for possible severe storms in the south and the snow event in the north and heavy rain in the east. But the temperature pattern overall, this is what it looks like for the next five days. Cold air exiting, replaced by the warm air. And day five through 10, the 12 Z European showed up with some cooler air here simply due to that large low that it was forming that it was gonna move on off to the north and east late next week. So that's just the cool air coming in behind it and the possibility of some snow. But as we did see the models, let's go back and find it, there it is. They dipped this deeper trough in there by day 10. And that's why the day 10 through 15 temperature pattern is warmer here where the trough is sitting. So we got the cooler air in place. Now I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, these shots of cooler air we've been getting since the end of October and beginning of November. And it makes me think about what the distribution of temperature looks like across the Northern hemisphere. So when you look back over the last 30 days, this is what we've got. What I want you to take note of is if you kind of put a line here almost on the continental divide. Let's draw that again. Maybe it's about right there, okay? We have yet to see a really large storehouse of cold air build up anywhere between the Canadian archipelago and the Hudson Bay. And if the East Coast wants to go cold and stay cold, you got to have that cold air in place. Instead, all the cold air is here over parts of Siberia. It's been coming around the Gulf of Alaska. And this has been the source region of so many of our big winter storms that have come here across the midsection of the country. 
Thinking about that, I do want to show you sea ice extent. Now, we've built up some sea ice nicely here in this part of the Arctic, but it's the Canadian archipelago that still needs to build in quite a bit. Where our sea ice currently sits is, it's below the climatological average, but we're not nearly as low as we were in 2012, which is the stash line. Watching that sea ice fill-in is going to be critical for the upcoming weeks in terms of how the cold air begins to propagate south out of the Arctic. And since we're talking about it, this was on November the 3rd, but we're looking at snowfall departures. So this is from the Rutgers University. And what I want to take note of here is we do have a big chunk of Canada and also a spot, spots here in uh, Russia that we're still looking at a deficit in the snow extent. My main story here is to tell you that without the deep establishment of colder air in place here, uh, the fact that it's on the other side of the main mountain chain, remember it's here and here, means to get sustained cold air to just sit in the eastern two-thirds of the country is going to be difficult. What I mean by sustained is 20 plus days of it. So let's add that to this complicating factor. We talked about this on Monday, the MJO. It tried to get out here into phase one and two, but it just quickly retreated back. And where is it heading? Maybe weakly into phase four, but more into phase five, six, and it could curl around over the next 30 days into seven. It's avoiding the Indian Ocean. It's avoiding most of the Western Pacific. And what I want to tell you is this. Should it pop out over there in phase five, that is supportive of letting that trough kind of move back a little bit to the west, which is what we talked about it doing, remember? So I think that is supportive and developing a ridge here and giving us that cold shot of air we're going to see once we get past, um, what, next Thursday, Friday. That, that seems to be consistent. This matches well with the fact that the MJO could be here by that time period. All right, where's it go? Is it going to phase six? It looks like it from the model forecast. Six re-energizes the trough over the Gulf of Alaska, builds in the ridge here. And what the translation is of this is that the pattern's open and moving. It's like five or six days, seven, eight days on, and then it backs back off again, and then it comes right back on. So don't get set on any given pattern. It's going to move. And by the way, these transitions we just talked about with the MJO, they're showing up very nicely in the trade wind field. Take a look. The blues represent where we've got stronger trade winds coming from this direction. The reds where we have the stronger kind of westerlies coming from that direction. And over the next 15 days, they meet right on this line, which if you look, starts off over phase five and moves over phase six. So I have some confidence in where this forecast is going. And this also tells me that this La Nina still has a lot of life in it, and it's going to continue to deepen and strengthen over the next probably 60 days or so. From there, let's just show you the long-range data that came out, and now you're going to see that fluctuation. This is the next seven days, and this is going to be a seven-day sliding window. Ready? So what we get is the warm-up, followed by the cool-down. That leads us almost in toward Thanksgiving, where there is another big cool-down around the end of the month. But then we may start December back with another warm-up again. So the temperature pattern, because the, because the overall flow is open and moving, it's going to continue to kind of go up and down. I think we're going to see more of that. And if you just look, I don't know, let's go from November 20 to December 20, we see this as the overall temperature pattern. And you don't see major deviations away from average because it's going to be a lot of above average than a lot of below average. So you put it all together, you get normal, right? On the precipitation side of it, I'm going to show you the whole 30-day window. With an open pattern, we get systems in the west, and they re-energize over the plains, and they come through the Ohio Valley and the Mississippi Valley. It does follow nicely with La Nina as favoring more drier conditions from Texas over to North Carolina. We kind of call that our cotton belt. So I'm going to watch that all very carefully. Hey, we get new long-range data on Friday night from the European. I'll put it in Monday's report. Look forward to talking to you then. Thanks.